just finished a six-week series on marriage and family titled Home. And if you missed any of those weeks and you're interested to catch them up, we do have them on our YouTube channel. You can go back. All of the videos are there. You can go back and, and uh, catch up on any of those that you may not have been present for. Also, if you were interested in doing any further reading or study in any of the topics that we talked about, I will be very, most happy to share my resource list with you, things from my library, recommendations on some stuff you can look into if you want to press a little further in any one of those areas. Just come and see me and visit with me about that. This morning we are beginning a new series in the book of Titus and uh, titled it The Church in Action. And I put on Facebook this week the idea that, you know, the church is not brick and mortar, right? Growing up it was easy to think that we would talk about going to church, you know, and that meant going to the building over there in the middle of town, you know, the white one with the steeple and the, and the different things, or in this case the big red one, you know, in the middle of the block. But, uh, the church is not a building, it's not brick and mortar, it's not studs and drywall, it's not, you know, concrete and, and those things. The church is people, right? It's us. It's built out of living stones, Peter writes, and, and joined together by Christ, who is the architect and the builder, and at the same time, the cornerstone that holds it all together. Collectively, then, we become not just the individuals that we are in Christ, but we become one body, and one body that is on the move, living and active. The church is not an organization, but rather an organism, living, breathing, and active. And so we do well to take a little bit of time to consider what does this body that we are together do, and how do we be the church? What does that look like? What does that mean? What difference does it make? And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking into the letter of Titus to get a picture of the church in action. And we're going to see that in the areas of, of leading, learning, and serving. This question becomes very important to me. Maybe it's not the question you're asking today, but today as we have family day and we've gathered all of us in here together and our kids and our youth as well, you know, we have youth and children's ministries not because we want them in a different place or out of the way, but because we believe every person is valued and deserves a clear presentation of the gospel at their level of understanding. And so we have King's Kids because I want these kids that you saw up here worshiping this morning to understand who they're worshiping and to know him. And I tell you what, they do. They do. And they hear the gospel at a level they can grasp. And our teens, we pull them together so they have a sense of community together, but again, to address things to where they're living at and what's going on in their world right now. So we have times to come back together like this, but I can tell you at the same time with all of them here that while you may not be asking that question, and as adults we might readily just accept the habit of being in church, or well, you ought to be in church on Sunday morning, you ought to do this, our kids are asking the question, why? Why should I be there? What difference does it make? It's kind of boring. It's kind of dry. I don't understand what it is we're trying to do. And so I think we, we need to remember and recall, and definitely I want to do something if it's boring, too. It shouldn't be. And we have an opportunity to come together and celebrate together, and I enjoyed our worship today. And kids, thank you. I love it every time in the month that you come in here and worship with us. Worship is, is different and in a dynamic way when you're here with us. So thank you for coming and leading songs this morning. It's a beautiful thing. But we need to understand, what is the value of this church thing for me? Is it just a habit? Is it just a ritual? Is it just the routine that I do? And so I want us to kind of grasp that and understand it. So we're going to dive into Titus today and take a look a little bit. We're going to begin right at the beginning, chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm going to read down through verse 4. Paul says, identifying himself, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This letter is so many in the New Testament. Uh, about half of our New Testament that we recognize is from Paul, written by him, or at least dictated by him, 
uh, to his helpers who wrote it down and sent to the encouragement of believers. And in this case, sent to a specific leader, uh, Titus, who we'll talk about in a moment. Paul begins in his usual way acknowledging his calling in Christ and in doing so reveals the purpose of this letter. He says this is for the faith of God's elect. What he's saying is that this is for the church. This is for the church. And I'm talking about church, big C, not little C. And I'll explain that to you this way, that we're gathered here this morning in this building at Kingsway, and we say that we are at the church, and we are the church. We are the church, small C. We are one household of a much larger family that goes way beyond us, way beyond not only our walls to other churches, around our community, to ones around our state, around our nation, literally around the globe. I've appreciated so much the opportunity to go to another country 9,000 miles around the planet and show up in a place where they were worshiping God and knowing that I was with family. And that collectively becomes the church, big C church, capital C. It is all of those who are called, like Paul, not just to that, but called to Christ. All of those who are called, chosen, and appointed to life through the grace of Jesus Christ. Those scripture refers to in some, in some verses as the elect. Those God has put out his call. He has put out mercy through Jesus Christ and grace through him, and he has called us back to himself. And the Holy Spirit reveals the truth of that, and we respond, and it sets us on uh, track for a destiny. This is where it talks about what he has destined us for. To those who have believed, those who have accepted the gift and the grace of what Christ has done, it set us on a journey. We have a destination, just like if you got a ticket and got on a boat out of the port down here, it's set for a certain destination. And we are destined for things in him, not the least of which is eternal life with our Savior. And so he's writing for the church. Now, why is the church so important? Because it's not an organization. You know, if all we came here for week by week was to have some kind of country club or party thing, you could probably find something more entertaining to do in Eagle River than just to be here. Now, I hope you do have fun when you're here, but let's face it, as a club, that's probably not the best thing going on. But the church is not an organization, it's us. And God has chosen us to set his affections on. That's why we were singing and worshiping the way we were this morning. We have received the love and the grace and the presence of God in our lives. He has chosen to love us. We're his. And it's awesome to enter into that relationship and know him and know that he knows us. And in that, we become also his message. This is that collective part. Together, we become a witness and a testimony because others see us and they see the grace of God in us and they see the actions that come out in our lives because of what he's done in us. And we become his message as well to those that are around us. And in all of this, we also need each other. You know, when we come to church, there's some things that we do, and they're good things if we come together and we, we pray. You know, just coming together even to worship the way that we do. You know, you can do any of these things on your own, right? God created you. He knows you. The Word says He knows you down to the very number of the hairs on your head. And in a beautiful place like Alaska, I can walk out my front door, and it's like, <sighs> praise God. You know, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's glorious. I love saying nobody paints like God does. You know, you can try to capture that image with a camera. You can try to reproduce it on canvas, but nobody paints like God does. And you can walk out your door and you can worship God and the beauty of nature and all those things surrounding you. And it's an awesome thing, and I encourage you to do that. When you go hiking and walking and, and all those things, take time to think about who made all of that and made it for you to enjoy and savor that moment. But there is something dynamic and powerful and different about us coming together and voicing that praise as one. Lifting our voices together, increasing the sound. You know the difference between the sound of one voice and the sound of many, right? We can listen to a soloist who sings very beautifully, and yet when you bring that whole choir of, of amazing singers together, the sound that it makes and the, the harmonies and the richness and the depth, there's a beauty in that. That's a part of what we are as the church. When we come together, we're no longer 
remember that solo voice singing praises to God, we become a whole chorus of voices that are giving him the kind of praise that he is worthy to receive and that he deserves. And so it's beautiful. And in that, you know, we can pray and we can meet with God and we can hear from God and I can hear from his word and he can speak to my heart no matter where I am. But when I come together with other people, there is opportunity for me to rub shoulders with somebody like Tico or somebody like Wade and people who bring some encouragement into my life. And Sister Ann, you're one of those people that brings encouragement into my life. Just with the things they say, they remind me of the gospel. They remind me of what God has done. They remind me of what he's done in my life as they share with me what he's doing in their life. All of a sudden, my faith that may have gotten a little low during the week through all my experiences, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm almost walking in the slump, you know. Guys, we have a tendency this way anyway. It's like we get shorter as we get older, but not really. It's just the weight of the world, you know. You just kind of, you carry the slump. It's like, you know, we need to stand up and get our shoulders back. And when I hear those things, I get up and my shoulders come back up. And I realize I serve a great and awesome and mighty and wonderful God. And so we encourage one another. And we have a relationship with one another. You know, it's, it's challenging to find real friends, right? And I'm looking around the room, and I'm, I'm kind of noticing real quick those of you that are maybe at least around my age or older. Truth is, if you're beyond your 20s or early 30s, we very seldom make a new friend. The close friends that you have in your life are ones that you made back in your teens and 20s, maybe into your 30s. We get a little more reclusive after that. We get a little more engaged with other things. And it's hard to find a really good friend. You know, if you've had really good friends in life, you're blessed. You know, people that you could trust, people that you could share with, people that were there for you in the moments that you really needed them. You know, that's what we are meant to be in this collective family as well. These are the people I come together with to laugh with to share with, to do life with. These are the people that I can say, man, I've got a problem and I'm not sure what to do. And trust that the advice I'm going to hear is godly counsel. These are the people that if I'm really struggling, I know I can trust to lean on and have them encourage me and keep me accountable and pray for me and not condemn me and be like, ew, you know, what, what's your deal? But to love me through my issues and see me get back on track. These are the people I can count on when I really need something. And the fair weather friends that are there when you've got lots of money and everything's good and you're throwing parties, they're glad to be there. But when you're in the rut and you need help and you've got nothing, these are the people that are still there. We need each other. And we need to understand that about church. I don't want to come here every Sunday morning because it's a habit or a tradition or to check off my righteous duty for the week. I come here to be family. I need you. We need each other. And that's what Paul's talking about. He writes this letter and these other letters and he encourages the church in this way because it is important that we be the church. Now, I'm a history nerd. I've shared that with you before. One of my favorite quotes goes way back to the 3rd century. There was a leader of the early church whose name was Cyprian of Carthage. The church was really strong in the early days coming out of Israel into North Africa. And so we have some great leaders who came out of Northern Africa. Augustine of Hippo, Cyprian of Carthage, different ones uh, that led the church that were bishops and leaders in their time. And Cyprian lived from about 200 to 258 A.D., but he made the statement, he said, he can no longer have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. Interesting statement, yeah? Augustine quoted that again uh, about 150, maybe 200 years later. Same idea. He cannot have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. Now, I'm not taking that as a scriptural truth to present to you, but I want you to grasp the idea of what he's saying. We claim God as our father, and he is. He's adopted us as his children. His word is plain about the love that he has lavished on us to make us his kids. And I always think that's really powerful, too, because, you know, we have kids, and, and you, you have your kids. It's kind of like the statement, you know, you can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives, you know. But this whole adoption thing to me is really powerful because somebody went out of their way to choose you and say, you're going to be mine. The Word says that God has chosen to adopt us as his children, set those affections on us, made us his own. And so when we do that, though, as we come in as children, we're part of a family, right? Just as when we're born into a family, you are part of a family. Within a family, you 
you have brothers and sisters who have a father and a mother, and hopefully they're nurturing and caring for you. And most of the time, it's your mother who is doing the nurturing and the caring and the raising and the training. And that's what Cyprian is trying to talk about. He said, we have God as our father. He's made a relationship with us and called us to be his kids. And he puts us with our brothers and sisters in a household, in a family, and that household is kind of like our mother. Our mother who trains us, you know, does the potty training and the teaching you how to eat and how to brush your teeth and how to do all those things that you have to learn how to do. That's what this place is for, is to train us and build, help us grow up and become who and what we're meant to be. It watches over us. It protects us. It teaches and trains us. And so this church is huge, and it's, it's valuable, and it's important in that way. It's not God, but it's something God has put in our life for our benefit to strengthen us. And so Paul says, I'm writing for the faith of God's elect, for the church, and for the knowledge of the truth. Hang with me. This is going somewhere. And the knowledge of the truth. The truth. What is the truth? You know, people have been asking that for centuries. Today, that really takes a beating because the whole idea out there is, well, there isn't really any truth. You know, it's all relevant. What's truth for you may not be truth for me. There, there is no absolute truth. And, uh, you know, it, which is kind of strange because even making the absolute statement that there is no absolute truth is kind of saying there's an absolute truth. But it runs in a circle. You know, the, the question's been asked over and over. The most powerful time I see it asked is when Jesus is standing before a man named Pontius Pilate. And he asked the question, what is truth? And if he would have just realized he was looking into the eyes of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. The truth is the gospel. The message that God created us, that God loves us in spite of our sin, that God has made a way to redeem us and bring us back to himself through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us. And that truth is the foundation of it all and the hope of every person. There is no other hope. There is no other hope. And it leads us, as these verses said, to godliness. It leads us to godliness. That's not a canny idea of godliness. You know, I don't know what that brings to your mind when you think of godliness, whether it's kind of prudish or it's, you know, even just in this holy, whatever it is. Leading us to godliness means becoming like him or becoming like Jesus, which is another one of those things that we are predestined to when we get that ticket of his grace. You know, his grace has been set on us and we're destined for the things that God has in mind. He says that we are destined to be conformed to the image or the likeness of his son. We are to become like Jesus. Christ. That's in Romans 8 29 if you want to take a look at it. That is part of our destiny. And it leads us to eternal life because right relationship with God is life. And without it, we are dead already. People apart from Christ are dead men walking. Ephesians makes that clear when he talks about how God's grace is a gift. It's not something we've earned, not something we can do for ourselves. He says, once we were all dead in our trespasses and our sins, but God loved us enough to do something about it. Adam and Eve in the garden, God said, when you, if you disobey me and you do this, you're going to die. And we read the story and it's like, hmm. He didn't, he didn't like zap them. They didn't die on the spot that they didn't bury them in the ground, but they did die that day. They died because they were separated from him. They ended up separated from their home in the garden, but the thing was they were separated from that presence of God that had walked with them in the garden in the cool of the day, that had surrounded them and talked with them and, and just shared joy with them. They were separated from him, and without him, there is no life. We are dead. Scripture talks about dying two ways. Yes, this body that we live in is under a curse. It's going to wear out. It's going to break down. It's going to decay. It gets old. It gets wrinkled. It gets tired. And one of these days, it's going to go in a box in the ground, and it's going to turn back to dust. And we recognize that as death, mainly because when we die, when life passes out of this body, when we breathe our last, we're looking, and that body's still there, but something's gone. The real person has been separated from that body, right? And the Word of God says there is a second death. So that one's there, and it's painful, and it's difficult, 
But he says, I'm going to overcome that one, no problem. But he said the second death, the one you don't want to die, is to be eternally separated from the presence of God. We have life in him. We are made alive again. His life comes into us. And that's what it is about. That becomes our hope that we have life in him. And it's proclaimed through the word, as we look at in scripture, and it's proclaimed through the church. Why? Because it's one thing to write it down. It's one thing to say it. How many of you like to see something, right? You can have somebody tell you about it, and you're like, man, I want to see that for myself. This assembly of people who come together with the life of Christ inside of us become the physical representation of the truth of what God has said. When people encounter that, they're like, oh, that's what that means. That's what that is. And so Paul writes this letter for the church and for the truth, for the gospel. And he writes this letter to Titus. Titus is another one of Paul's young assistants like Timothy. We hear a lot about Timothy, but Titus is another one who came to Christ under Paul's ministry, was a close companion and a fellow laborer. In fact, this is someone very intimately known to Paul. He's one of the ones he refers to as my son, like he does Timothy. Somebody feels like a father too. Somebody he has mentored. You have the idea of mentoring, a mentor and a protege. This is one of Paul's proteges, very close to him, this Titus. He went with him. He was probably along with him uh, in a lot of the things that happened in Acts, though his name doesn't appear in, in those verses. But we find him frequently in the letters and what Paul says about him. And it's the same idea, this close companion. He's writing to someone who means something to him. He's like, I've got to impart this information, this truth to you about how you're living and how you're ministering and how you're leading in the church. Because the ministry of the church is a family type Ministry. It's what I keep trying to stress with this. We need to recognize that we're family. We're not just a bunch of people that happen into the same place at the same time. We're family. And we need to be family for each other. We're family. And it's that mentoring, that life-on-life -life investment that you can watch, you can look into my life, and, and I want our lives to brush up against each other so that we have an influence on each other. It's relational ministry, and in doing so, it is leading. Now, how many of you have ever caught a bad habit from your folks? Anybody? We usually find out about it after we get married, because after we get married, we have new eyes that see and say, you know, you do that just like your dad. <laughs> or you do that just like your mom, you know? You are so much like them, it's not even funny. And you're like, what? You know, we get offended at it. I am not. Yes, we are. Yes, we are, because the reality is that more is caught than taught. Okay, we teach all the time. I mean, in our culture, our Western culture about how smart we are, you know, we think we're so smart. We teach everything, right? And now we have the Internet, so you, we know everything, right? It's, it's all there. If it's on the Internet, it's got to be true, right? But anyway, we have all this information that we teach and we know and we learn. But you know, more is caught than taught. The way people really learn is what's modeled in front of them, what they see, what they experience, what they watch. That's why you know your kids, and you can be talking to them about how they, when they grow up, the way they should drive and all the things that they should do. And, and then you're in the back seat one day, and you hear your kid hollering out from the back, "Hey, buddy, hurry up! The turtles are honking." You know why? Because he's heard it somewhere before. Okay. It's caught. They capture. They see what we do. They experience and watch us. It's been modeled and patterned into them. The reason that shows up in our life as an adult is because that was modeled and patterned into us. This is where this becomes really important because this is one of those environments where we are molding, shaping, influencing, and patterning what we're going to do. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. The first thing about the church in action that we're going to see today is this idea of leading. Leading and leadership. And that's what Paul's really getting to. Verse 5. Let me get you back into Titus 1. He says, the reason I left you, Titus, in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, 
He must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Paul entrusted Titus with a task for the good of the church and the furthering of the truth, the gospel. And that was specifically appointing elders. Elders in scripture are pastors. They're the leaders over local church bodies. Paul was an apostle. He went as a missionary from place to place, engaged in evangelistic ministry, would gather a following, teach the truth of the gospel. People would respond. He stayed in places anywhere from a very short time, maybe of a few weeks to a few years in an individual place as he was doing ministry. And then as the body would come together, he didn't stay there to pastor that body. He would appoint leaders, eldership to lead and take care of and shepherd that body. And so he's left Titus in Crete. Crete is an island in Greece, if you're familiar with your geography, and that's where this ministry was happening at that time. And so he leaves him in Crete, and he says, I want you to finish what wasn't done yet. I, I moved along, but we still need elders and shepherds in these places. That's the task that he's left to. And the reason for this is because of this leading that needs to happen in the church that we've just been talking about, this group of people who comes together and what they do. You see, there's this thing about guidance that we need. You know, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd, right? One of the images that he used for himself, one of the metaphors, I am the good shepherd watching over the sheep. And he acknowledged that his people are like sheep, uh, you know, where we really are kind of simple that way. So we think we're really smart, but we're kind of like sheep. He says we're like sheep that need to be shepherded. Heard somebody say one time, you know, sheep, you, you do all this with them, but pretty much all you get back from them is that. You know, that's, that's it. That's all there is. But we need to be shepherded. The idea is that we don't wander into the truth. Right? We don't wander into the truth accidentally. We wander into all kinds of trouble accidentally, some of it intentionally, but we don't wander into the truth accidentally. We have to be guided towards the truth. And leadership, that's what it does. Leading guides us towards the truth, the gospel, and towards this godliness of being transformed and conformed to the image of God's Son. Now that applies within the church as he's appointing elders and you have a pastor because as a pastor leads the church that direction, it still applies to the rest of us because at the same time the church is leading others to the truth. Like I said a minute ago, we collectively become that witness of what God has done on the inside. When people want to see what this book is saying, they look at the body collectively and its individual members to see what that looks like. And in modeling that and in demonstrating that, we collectively are leading people towards the truth and towards life, right? Because we're bringing them closer to the gospel. They're not going to wander into it on their own. They need some guidance. Now, he brings out this idea of character in here, an essential quality of leadership. I don't care how skilled somebody is how awesome they are, how much charisma they've got. If they don't have any character, I want nothing to do with it. And I don't think you probably do either. There's this idea of character. It's an essential quality for leadership. But I look at this list, you know, and, and did you see this list we just read? Man, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Seems a little overwhelming. And you know, as we, we try to stand up and lead in the church, there's a weightiness of that feeling too. It's like, I, hmm, I don't know, you know? thankful for the grace of Jesus Christ and for what he, he does in us. But it, it does seem very overwhelming. Why such a standard? Because a leader should be someone who can be followed, right? A leader should be someone you can trust. Someone that you can follow. Now I have a few of our kids here this morning that would want to come up and help me. Any of you back there? Aiden, come on up, buddy. Anybody else wants to help? Mabel, Edith, any of you guys? Natalie, you're welcome. David, you guys can stop right here for a second. These are my buddies. They're good, y'all. 
every time we hear family day, it's great. If you guys can kind of line up across this side going this way, just past the guys here. Just kind of jump in wherever you fit. Find a spot here. Awesome. Emma, welcome to the team. All right, this is my team. We're good. You guys ever play Follow the Leader? Yes. You get it, right? Okay. So if you're playing Follow the we're going to play Follow the Leader, you're going to follow me, okay? So just watch. I'm going to talk to them, but you're going to follow me, okay? So we do the like, follow the leader thing, and it's really cool because you watch a leader, and you notice what they do. Come in, brother. You're scared of me. The kids are helping me. Come on. And, you know, they follow you along, and they, they watch what you do, and they mimic what you do, kind of just like what we were talking about. Good morning, dear. Good to see you. Don't miss them. And they learn about the things that we're doing while well, they follow the leader. And you know, they were good leaders this morning too because they came up here. And if you watched them really close, you could follow because they were doing the signs. Signs. <laughs> and they were doing the, the motions and the symbols and the whole thing and what was going on. And, but we get that idea that we can mimic and learn something. I'm kind of a slow learner. You guys were doing much better than me. But we learn all these kinds of things. And you know, at night when you take them and you tuck them into bed and we're learning to pray too, they're learning and being modeled those things of following the leader. And it's being invested and patterned on them in what they're learning. And so they're learning to do good things and learning to praise God and learning to pray and learning to praise God and learning to pray. You guys are awesome. Come on down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Emma. They're awesome. Okay, now here's the thing. We also caution our kids, don't we, about who they follow and whose example they, they're going to pattern themselves after, whose stuff they're going to copy. And in fact, sometimes when they come home and they copy something they see, we have a little trouble, don't we? Time for a little bit of correction. A leader has to be someone of character. Someone of quality, someone who can be trusted so that when they follow that modeling and that patterning, it's something you can put confidence in, something you can trust, something you can look at. Paul, Paul said it this way, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So I'm not perfect, but I'm going to set you a good example that you can follow. Leadership within the church, he said, better be able to set that kind of example to say, if you don't, you know, you don't want to hear somebody say, well, don't do what I do, do what I say. You want to hear somebody say, do it like I'm doing it, and you'll be pretty good, okay? You'll be doing all right. We're not perfect, but it'll put you in the right direction. It'll put you going where you need to go. Modeling an example is the real influence of leadership. Leadership is not about power and authority. We often think that that's what it is. Well, I want to be the boss. You know, I want to kick back, put my feet up on the desk, tell people what to do. That's leadership, power and authority. It's not. Leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. And even as the church, it, it's not about power and authority. It's influence. Even as the church, we don't have to try to control somebody's behavior. We make this mistake sometimes in trying to be an influence on society. If we take people from a different worldview who do not believe, who do not submit to Christ, and we try to impose control on them over their behavior, that's foolishness. What we have the opportunity to do is not to control them with power and authority because we don't have power and authority over them. What we need to do is seek to use the influence that God has invested in us to mold and shape and touch their life, to lead them in the right direction. Amen. And that's what we're called to. But we've got to seek to influence and to lead. He talks about guidance because we don't wander into the truth. He talks about character because we need to be trustworthy to have influence to lead. And he talks about responsibility. Again, leadership is not about power and authority. It is about care and concern and sacrifice. We hit on this in the home series when we were talking about men as husbands and dads, right? 
He should be the king of your castle, but that's not so that you can be some tyrant in the castle. That's because you become the guy that says, hey, the buck stops here. I'm going to take care of these people, these ones that live within my little realm. I'm the one that provides for them, takes care of them, makes sure that everything's okay. I'm, I'm the one that's here for them. I'm going to defend them and watch over them and, and be here for them. And if something needs done, I'm going to make sure it gets done. Care, concern, and sacrifice. That's the idea. And that's what Paul's talking about with these leaders, is they're going to take responsibility for this body. That's what happens within the church. God has assigned leadership to take responsibility, not to lord it over people. He made that plain with his disciples. He said, you guys are jockeying for position. He said, you missed the whole deal. He said, the one that's the greatest among you is going to be the one who's ready to serve. The one who's ready to watch out for the one next to them, take care of them, and provide for them. What if... What if the church took on the role of demonstrating the love of Christ through care, concern, and sacrifice instead of trying to control the behavior of non-believers? Wow. I think that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to move. Verse 10. I need to wrap this up this morning. He says, for there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit doing anything good. There's a battle going on. There is a battle going on. It's a battle for hearts and minds. It's a battle against the truth because there is truth. There is truth in Jesus Christ. There is truth in His Word. And there is a battle against the truth, that truth which is our hope and our salvation. But the church in action, leading as it is called to lead, stands for the truth, defending those who would be led astray, showing care, concern, and protection for them, watching over those who would be led astray, and confronting those who are deceived, all in the hope of restoration that leads to life. There's this idea that's presented here of defending, defending. You say, oh man, a battle? Really? Are you sure? But the reality is, even from the time of Paul, when the faith was really, really new, you know, back in the, the first century, right down to this time, 2,000 years later, there's a battle going on, and there is a need for defending, because not everything that looks like a sheep is a sheep, right? Not everything that looks like a sheep is a sheep. And we've got to be a little bit savvy, and a little bit aware, and a little bit ready to deal with it. And uh, I dare say any of you around your house, if the wolves come down out of the hills, you probably have an idea how you're going to handle it, don't you? We need to kind of have an idea about how we're going to handle it, because it does have to be handled, or it's going to wreak havoc. And there's going to be damage, and there's going to be carnage, and there's going to be problems. And so Paul speaks against, in his time, what were the legalists, the circumcision group, those who wanted to bring extra rules. I say legalists because that was their whole thing. They wanted to add conditions to the gospel. Well, yeah, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also need to do this, this, and this. If you do this, this, and this, you might be good enough for God. He said, that's trash. And that's still trash, but we still run into it today because there's some people who still want to say, on top of the gospel, well, no, you've got to do this, 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 and this, or... It's not going to, no. Jesus' blood poured out for us on the cross. His death in our place was enough. It was enough. 
And that's what we stand for, the truth of the gospel. And so he says we've got to defend against those who want to manipulate and control, those who want to put laws and, and, and issues and rules and, and different things to control people, who do it maybe even, as he says, for some of them for dishonest gain, to manipulate a following or whatever it is they're trying to do. But he says we, we stand against that. And we stand to protect those who may not be able to discern it for themselves. Even like these little ones that we have in the room. And they hear something and they just don't know. Well, that sounds good. They're trustworthy, right? They need someone to defend them. There's the defending and there's also the confronting. None of us probably likes confrontation. If you do, I might be a little concerned. Some of, some of you might. Some of you like a good scrap on that. It's kind of part of it. Confrontation, though, generally, we're not real eager for it. You know, we're not real anxious for confrontation. But there is a time for confrontation. But when the confrontation comes, it's not a smackdown either. It's not to beat somebody into the ground. It's not to overcome. It's not to triumph and be, yeah, yeah. The confrontation that we get into is not to drive somebody into the ground. It's to push them to restoration. It's to say, hey, you're going down the wrong path and you need to get back on the right track. And I'm here to help you. I'm not here to throw you out because you're weird or you're strange. I'm here to say, hey, we've got a problem. Be humble and repent. Let's get you back on track. Let's bring you back into this. It's with restoration in mind, the same way that God seeks to restore us rather than to punish us. The only harsh words that you'll find in Scripture from Jesus and even in this passage are the ones who want to continue to stand and claim, I've got it right, I'm living according to the gospel, I'm a person of God, and continue to go down the wrong path. Those are the ones he's talking about at the end that are fruitless. Those are the ones that are self-condemned. Those are the ones who claim to know and represent God but deny Him by the things that they do. And there does come a time in Scripture when it talks about how to handle them. Someone who refuses to be repentant, then we have to put some distance between and not reject them utterly, but treat them as an unbeliever, somebody who needs to come to faith because their faith is not right. And so there's this confronting that does happen. And real leadership does not seek to keep people in bondage. It seeks to set them free. To set them free. To see them become mature. To see them be able to function on their own. To see them be discerning in their own mind. It doesn't seek to keep them in control, but to set them free. And good leadership brings discernment of the inconsistencies of those who claim to know God, but demonstrate they do not. You know, Jesus spoke very plainly as well about the fact that the gospel in us does become visible. He said, you bear fruit like a tree. Now you look at an apple, you see the apples on the tree, you know it's an apple tree. You see the oranges on the tree, you know it's an orange tree. You see olives on the tree, you know it's an olive tree. You know, it, it is what it is. He says, we're like that. The fruit comes out. He said, people can see the fruit and they know. And so he talks about here those who claim to be an apple tree, but they're, they're making oranges. There's something wrong there, you know. It's, it's not the right thing. And so he says, we, we get past that, but... Good leadership brings discernment of inconsistencies and moves God's people towards godliness, being conformed to the image of the Son, and towards good works, which is going to be a further part of this series as we go through the next two chapters. We are the church, the church in action. We're not just here to be here. We don't just sit. We don't come in every week just to be a tradition and a function. We're the church in action. We have a role to fill. We have something that we do. Leading, learning, serving, those things are going to come out through this text. But we are the church in action, and in this idea of leading, we lead people into the truth. We bring them to the knowledge of the truth of God's grace and salvation in Jesus Christ and godliness, the fact that he wants to make us do and make us like him. We do so with character and with courage, the courage to defend and confront. And this week and this, this season, this week of Thanksgiving and this holiday season, Christmas time that we're coming into, we have the opportunity to lead others to truth through our Thanksgiving. You know, we really have the opportunity to do it every time we eat. And we stop and we, we give thanks to God because every time we eat, we acknowledge that I need something from beyond myself 
to sustain me and give me life. And that God has provided for me what I could not provide for myself. And spiritually, it's the same thing. I need something from beyond myself to sustain me and give me life. And it's something I cannot provide for myself. But God has provided it for me. And we have the opportunity to be a testimony of that in our thanksgiving and through the care and concern and sacrifice that we show for others. Operation Christmas Child, we've been doing just wrapped up this week. I don't know how many boxes we finally ended up with. We had 60 out of school. It was fantastic. As the kids pack those up and put those together, I was, I was thrilled. We've got other things going on. We're, we're helping with uh, the blessings with Love Inc., Thanksgiving blessings, and uh, that stuff we're wrapping up today and, and taking over, and, and some volunteers that will go and help with that. That's what we do with your Christmas Advent Conspiracy. You know, that demonstration of care and concern and sacrifice becomes a testimony of that as well. So being a part of the church, back to where I started this morning, is a safeguard for each of us. Coming here is a safeguard for us. It keeps us healthy. It keeps us on track. It keeps us encouraged. It keeps us built up. It keeps us connected to the Lord and to each other. And being a part of the church is being a witness to the truth and leading the way for others. Because there's a whole lot more of the gospel's intended recipients who haven't yet grabbed a hold of it. I want to leave you with this verse this morning in Hebrews probably written by Paul, but we're not sure as well. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That hope that we have, it's coming. And every day it's one day closer than it was. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray with you. We're going to have the opportunity to partake together as family of communion today as well. Let me pray over you right now. Father, we thank you again for the privilege to be in this house, the privilege to be your kids. Lord, your love that has been lavished on us. Lord, may we treat it as something special to be family. And may we regard each other with special care and concern as brothers and sisters, with respect and dignity, and to be there for them in every possible way. Lord, help us to recognize our role together as a church to be leading. Lord, we find leadership within the church to help us stay on track, and we collectively are leading people towards you in the way that we live as we follow your gospel. Lord, may we walk with that reality in our mind day by day with the people that we encounter. And they would be both blessed and a blessing. Lord, if there's someone here who hasn't entered into that relationship with you, I pray that they would realize, Lord, what you've done. That all of us miss the mark, that we were short of what you desired for us. Lord, that, that, that sin or disobedience to you has separated us and we're on the path to death. But Lord, through Jesus, you came and you paid the penalty for all the wrong we've ever done. All that disobedience, all the sin against you and offered forgiveness as a gift. Mercy that we don't receive the punishment we deserve and grace that we receive the gift that you're giving to be children of God. Lord, I pray that you would press on their heart today to accept 